nations that we travel to. And so, of course, the immediate response is always, is there a church in Mongolia? <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, for a long, long time, it's like every time when people think about Mongolia, you know, they think about so many other things. <laughs> but the Church of and Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ is so Mongolian. And so they were, they, they were, they were amazed. They were shocked. <laughs> they were astonished that uh, in 30 years what the Lord has been doing here. So we have we have told your story to a lot of people. And, uh, your story is the story of uh, this church. The story of uh, Pastor Bagi, Pastor Sud. <laughs> the story of their lives. The story of what they have been through for all these years. And uh, what's happening to this church. And so, so in, in a real way, Mongolia has been in our hearts all these time. And uh, so it was it eventually we know that Eugene and the wife have to come. And uh, so they're going to come and they will share their heart with all of us. And uh, so Andrew is not with me, but he's really missing this trip, so he gives his love to all of you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you really love this place, yes. And, uh, he, remembers, he remembers some of your name better than I do. <laughs> all right, and, uh, so we went home and we were trying to look at pictures and trying to change all your names. <laughs> names that we can call, we can remember. <laughs> So many of your names I keep forgetting. <laughs> so we try to give Christian and James and Mike. <laughs> and so but we don't we don't call you that name here, okay? <laughs> So we, we look forward to spend this whole time with you. And it's really a joy for all of us to be here. And uh, we're seeking the heart of the Lord. Uh, because every time that we're gathered in this manner, we're conscious that we're under his lordship. And it's under his lordship that we are saved. And so many times uh, we want to say so many things and talk about so many other areas. And, uh, and all of our being, all of our minds, our emotions, and our reasoning seems to run all over the place. But uh, we're not in any other meetings. This, this is a meeting where Jesus is the Lord above all. So we're conscious to seek his mind. And, and to desire his will. And this is why we're here. Is to believe that his mind and his counsel is the highest. That there is something in the heart of the Lord that he wants to bring to us. That is timely. 
that is uh, in season, that all of us is required to understand and to hear. Because he is the head of the church. And he is the groom to the bride. And so the church is his house. So when you're in the house, there's always house matter. There's always house problem. And not all in the house uh, are of the same mind, the same level, the same maturity. That's why running a family is so difficult. And, uh, and God wants to speak to his family. He wants to bring his house in order. Because the house that is not in order cannot fulfill the desire of the Father. And so he has to bring the house under discipline. Is that wonderful? How wonderful is that, that we can be Malaysians and you can be Mongolian. But the moment when we sit together, it's not what the Mongolian wants. It's not what the Malaysian wants. It's not what the American wants. It's not what the Australian wants. It's not what the Japanese wants. It's what the Lord wants. So there is no such meeting like this on the face of the earth. This is the only kind of meeting that the Lord has his will and his mind at the very center. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, so it is indeed a joy for us to be here. And, uh, it's always a joy to see Pastor Sud and, and uh, Pastor Paddy. Pastor Sud and Pastor Paddy. Always interesting to to hear someone who speaks English and the other party who don't speak English. I'm quite used to it. We go to different parts of the world where things like this happen. Praise the Lord. Now, we'll be here for the next uh, four evenings together. And I'm trusting that the Lord is going to begin a little bit of a journey for all of us together. And uh, when I say a little journey, is because the journey, the, our faith is a journey of faith. Because our faith is a relational reality. And every time when there is a relationship, then there is going to be a journey. Because you can't hurry a relationship. There is no instant relationship. Because relationship is wrong. Relationship is difficult. And uh, if you don't believe it, the church is 2,000 years old. Israel is 4,000 years old. And yet, look at the problem with the church. Look at the problem with the children of Israel. 
Israeli who would be a sort of It's a relationship. It's a relationship that God has to teach us all along the way. So I want to share with you some of the lessons in this relationship. I want to share it with you is because it was also my relationship. And for many of us who are Christian, once we've lost that relationship, and when that relationship is a problem, that's going to be many other problems that will come to your life. And even having to understand the Bible is a problem. And having to live as a man, that's a problem. Having how to be a woman, that's a problem. How to be a husband and a wife. How to be sons and daughters. How to be uh, a man who works in the world with a career. Becomes a problem. Now it all begins with our relationship. Now I want to share with you a little story. And uh, because in any journey, there's always stories that's going to come with it. Any one of you here today who has a relationship with Jesus has stories to tell. You know, last year when I came, I have not seen Pastor Sud for almost about 12 years. So, I met a long time ago in a little place called Bonio, Sabah. Which is a part of Malaysia. And so we were together in that school, in that training for about 28 days. So I knew I knew very little of her. But the very little that I knew about her, it kind of remained in me for a long time. And so you may remember I said last year when I came that I tried to write to her. And uh, she was she was hoped that one day I will come to Mongolia. So it didn't happen. Well, it's because the Lord knows. And sometimes, sometimes the Lord has to wait for some of our journey to go further. You know, you understand when the journey goes further? Because sometimes in life, when your journey goes further, then when you meet again, when you speak together again, it's, it's more meaningful. See, it becomes more meaningful. Have you ever learned something in life? You can say a lot of things. And then 10, 15, 20 years later, you're saying the same thing. <laughs> now that you're saying it, it carries meaning. It carries weight. When you talk about it, it hits you. It brings tears to your eyes. <laughs> but when you first say it many years ago, <laughs> it 
it just disappears. It just falls on the ground. Because journey. And so, perhaps that's the reason why the Lord has to wait for 12 years. So, I remember that last year when we came, all it took was just less than what, 48 hours. About, just about two days just into talking with Pastor and everybody. So many things make sense. Right. I immediately understood what he was saying, she was saying. What she, what she went through. What happened, what happened to her life? What happened to her spiritual journey? What happened between her and 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 and, Abby and the church previously and all the sorrows and the painful experiences? That's the journey that she has taken. And so our stories in the journey is very important. It's very sad that so many Christians today have no stories. We don't pay attention to the stories of our lives. And when we don't, we're going to have problems. We're going to have problems in our relationship. First with, first with God. And soon with many other things in life. That's why the lesson that Israel has to learn all through her journey is that Israel must not forget those stories. If you read the prophets, the prophets was retelling the stories of Israel. You want to read the prophets? That's why it's so painful to read the prophets. It's so difficult to read the prophets. Because these prophets will not tell you their own story. Telling the story of Israel. Because Israel has forgotten her story. They don't remember. They choose not to remember. Right? Because they were living in disobedience. That's why every time when we disobey, something about our remembering is affected. I say again, every time when we disobey God, we lose the capacity to remember. Our story gets messy, get into trouble. We don't, we don't remember. We, we start to get confused. We don't know what is what anymore. And having to retell the stories to the nation of Israel. Having to retell the story of Israel was a chance. A chance for Israel to remember again. And remembering. Oh, I want to say this is very important. In remembering. Alright? It's always in remembering. In remembering. 
that all that is inside us begin to respond. Тэр түүхийг санахад эргүүлээд санахад бид нэг доктор байгаа бүх зүйл түүнд ингэж хариу үзүүлж байдаг байна. There's a challenge that all that is inside of us starts to come out. Our emotions start to be stirred. Тэгэхээр тэр түүхийг санаалж байгаа бид нэг бүх сэтгэл хөдлөл бидний доктор байгаа бүхнийг ингэж дахин босгож ирэх, дахин гаргаж ирэх гэж бодсон. Тэгээ бид нэг оюун бодол ингэж Everything on the inside of us begin to realize. We begin to remember now how good God has been. How God has been faithful. How God has been kind. How God has been angry. How God has been merciful. And how we have been rebellious. This, this is what happens when you remember. Because everything on the inside is brought to the present. Right? That in remembering everything of the past is brought into the present. Тэр санах одоо үйл явцад өнгөрсөн болсон бүх зүйлс маань одоо цаг дээр ирж байгаа. And it is and when we see that. Тэр бид нар үүнийг харахад through remembering. Санах үйл явцаар дамжуулна. Because of our story. Тэр түүхүүдийнхээ улмаас. And when God sees that. Бохон үүнийг харахад. God bring his presence into our lives. Үүнийг харахдаа өөрийнхөө оршууд бидний амьдрал дээр буулгадаг юм аа. Авчирдаг байна. Got the point? That's why in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul said to the children of Israel, He said, For all these years you have been reading the prophets. The Jews were going on, were going into the synagogue every Shabbat, every Sabbath. And part of what they read are the prophets. And Paul said, you have been reading, all of our fathers have been reading the prophets. But they never heard the voices of the prophet. But all these prophets are in the past, they're long gone, they're dead. They left the writings for Israel. So Paul said, you've been hearing, you've been hearing the prophets. But you have not heard the voice of the prophets. Because why? What is the voice of the prophet? The voice of the prophet is the voice of God. And what is the voice of God through these prophets? Remember. Remember. Remember your story. Remember what I did in you. Remember how I took you from the house of bondage. Remember how I visited you. How I came to you. And so God begins to tell all of Israel's story again. I always say, when we start to forget our story, because something is only wrong with our spiritual life. Something has happened. And so many Christians today cannot tell this story. Some Christians don't even have stories to tell. And so when God sees that we are acknowledging our stories, we are, we, are we are confessing our story. 
We're remembering our story. We are agreeing with the story. We're responding to the story. God comes. Is that strange? God comes. God meets you at the very point of the story. That's the story of Israel. Every time a people respond to the prophets, as the prophet we tell the story, God appears to them. God comes to them. Now, some years ago, there was a cry in my heart. Part of my story. My story went for almost 40 years with the Lord. Sometimes when you when you go through your journey with the Lord, we tend to forget. So God comes and reminds you. Right? Thank God for pastors like what you have who comes and see you and remind you. And how we take it for granted. How we take it for granted, how we don't care. How, how we sometimes think that you know, they're pastors, so they're supposed to come and see us and visit us and bring coffee with us. They, 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 are, they are the one that comes and remind you. Remind us. This is what God has been doing. Remember, five years ago, I preached, I preached, and I said something to you. Remember that? Half the time you're yawning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know the attitude that we have today. <laughs> Wonder why God cannot come to some of our lives. <laughs> with, no with no capacity to remember. <laughs> we refuse to remember. <laughs> we, we look down upon having to remember those things. So some years ago the Lord came into my heart and, and reminded me something. And uh, it was like any other day or week or month, it was normal, nothing special. And uh, my heart was seeking the Lord. My face was towards the Lord. And uh, there were a lot of things happening in the ministry. And uh, we're going through some difficult times. As a church. And uh, Something happened one morning. Just some very quiet, no special light, no special demonstration. <laughs> and uh, I was having my regular time with the Lord, and with the scripture. And then it was as if that, you know, in a very quiet way, God always comes in quiet ways. That's who he is. He loves, as a father, he loves to come to his children. So he came to this child, this son of his, in a quiet way. And uh, I didn't ask for it. I wasn't in particularly seeking over something. 
I didn't write something down and say, God, you must do this, you <laughs> must <laughs> get to me. I didn't put any pressure, I didn't put any pressure on God or on myself. And uh, it was just my regular way of waiting in His presence. But then suddenly something crept into my heart. I've never heard something like this in my heart. That arrested me. Something on the inside began to break loose. And I remember that the, if I could just melt into the floor, I want to do that. I don't just want to go down on the floor, I want to melt into the floor. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm English speaking. I read an English Bible. So when thought comes to me, they come to me in English. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. God always bring his thoughts into your heart in the language in which you speak. Right? So, and God speaks perfect English. <laughs> and he speaks perfect Mongolian. <laughs> and God spoke very clearly. Impress even if I hear no sound. I have a little quiet, quiet corner in my, in my room. And this is what came to my heart. You cannot know me. You cannot know me. Unless you like me. Just one time. You know, some people say that God speaks in three times. For me, one time in <laughs> I talk over. When I heard this, I began speaking. I remember my tears were running down. My head was starting to go on my Bible. I was my, my, I was, my butt was slipping out of the chair. I wasn't sobbing, I wasn't crying, but everything inside my heart was moved upside down. I don't know how long I sat in the chair, I, I couldn't move, and I started praying. And I started asking. I started responding. I started remembering. I remember. I remember the prayers I prayed. I remember the scriptures I read. I remember the things I spoke to people. See, it's strange, isn't it? I remember. I remember speaking in conferences in schools about how important it is for us to know Him. The ways we need to know Him. I remember, I started to remember saying that we cannot know God like we know, you know, our fathers and our mothers and our lovers and our husbands and our wives. I remember, I remember, I remember things that I used to preach and say. For, for all my years. I, I, I used to tell people, I said, I said that, that knowing God is the highest calling of a human life. That the highest calling of a man, of a woman, 
Born onto this earth is to know God, is to love Him with all of our hearts, all of our mind, all of our soul, with all of our strength. That to know God is, is something that will demand your entire life. To know God is, some, is more than something in your head. To know God is an intimate knowledge that will require everything that is within you. So, I didn't know that that morning God was waiting. And I didn't know that God has been waiting for so long. Remember, the, remember I showed you that sometimes in relationship you can say something you can hear something there's no meaning to you and God has to wait he has to wait 10 years 15 years 20 years and since suddenly because God now begins to see that there's something in your heart that's ready. There's something in your heart that you are now prepared, you're ready to hear what God is going to say. I didn't ask. But this has been my life. This has been my life. The cry to know God. I have served. I have served. I preach. I have labored. I have labored from, from sunrise to sundown. I have labored. I've labored. I, and, and the strange, you know, sitting in that chair is like suddenly my entire spiritual life was all brought in one moment. Can you imagine that? So it's, I remember sitting there, and uh, I don't know for how long, because I remember my wife was, was wondering why I didn't come out. Because she usually know my regular hours in and out. So she said, this is so what happened? Is everything all right? Because you didn't come out for a long time. And there I was sitting there. I started responding to what God was saying to me. You cannot know me unless you are like me. What do you do when you hear something like that? I remember, I said, God, I said, I'm not like you. Oh, God, I'm not like you. And, and then it, it, it became clear to me for the for the first time. And I want to take this night, next four days with you. And uh, you know, break some bread here. This is a big loaf of bread. I want to break pieces by pieces. So I started praying and I started crying. And, and I started sobbing quietly. I had my hand on my chest. And I was doing this, you know. I'm doing this to my granddaughter, is it Jesus? Is in your heart? Jesus, Jimmy, Dr. Barrett, Jesus, Jimmy, Jesus, I said, God, but I'm not like you. I'm not like you. 
How many of you know that we're not like that? Oh boy, you Mongolians, you're like Mongolians. <laughs> <laughs> Tanner is Mongolian. 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 I said, God, I'm not like you. Help me. Help me. Teach 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 me. You, you just got your salvation or what? <laughs> I've been saved for 40 over years. <laughs> no big deal with God. <laughs> None of us can boast about how long we've been a Christian. <laughs> how long we've been reading the Bible. <laughs> how long you've been saved. <laughs> Forty more years later, and this is coming into your heart. There was a point in which God had to call my entire life to remembrance. And I want, and I want, I want to lovingly say this to your heart. When we don't remember. We forsake the opportunity of ever having to mature further. If we don't remember, if we forsake remembering, if we refuse to remember, we're going to forsake. That means we're going to lose the opportunity of ever maturing. You know why so many men and women today are so immature sitting in the church? Because many of us has forgotten. And because we have forgotten, many of our stories are very badly formed. We don't have stories. We, we, can't, we can't tell our stories. We can't tell our past. We can't speak of our pain. We can't talk about our past forgiveness. We cannot confess our past mistakes and our weaknesses. You see that? Yes. So many of our stories has holes. You understand what And when you have holes, whatever God pours into you, it will leak out. That's why so many Christians have serious leakage problem. So it began in my heart. And it was a wonderful day for me. And uh, it took shape and form in the days to come. The prayer that I prayed that morning. Because immediately I said to God, I'm not like you. And uh, Lord, make me like you. You see, for a long time I did not know. You know, as as a, as a Christian and as a minister of the gospel, if you sit in the church long enough, 
There's so many ways that we have been told. For example, for example, we've been told that if you want to know God, make sure you know your Bible. Isn't it? Make sure you study the Word. Know your Bible. In, inside out. Front to back, back to front. If you want to, if you want to know God, serve the will of God. If you want to know God, follow follow the teachings of Jesus. If you want to know God, be faithful. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to the church. Be faithful in your giving. If you, want to, if, you, if you want to know God, make sure you pay tithes. <laughs> Am I touching anything here? <laughs> if you want to know God, make sure you do good things. Look after the poor. Feed the widows. Why am I telling you all this? That's what I have learned. That's what I have also learned as a, as a Christian. All my life. And have I been doing all of that? I suppose I have. If I have failed, only the Lord will have to have mercy on me. And I'm not talking just as a Christian here today. I'm a pastor. I'm a servant of the Lord. Shouldn't I have done all of these things? Because I'm teaching others. My pastors were teaching others. But it never hit me like it hit me that morning. And then suddenly, I truly realized why I, why we have not known him. Why so many of us are struggling. Why so many men and women everywhere in the church are struggling, are defeated. And frustrated <laughs> and failed <laughs> day after day, <laughs> year after year, <laughs> and all of our efforts <laughs> has made us to even try harder. <laughs> you know, all those things that I said that we need to do in order to know God, how many of you know that we double up? <laughs> If I fast 40 days, that's not enough. I'm going to fast 70 days. If I read the Bible two hours a day, that's not enough. I'll read four hours of Bible. And today, this is the cry of Christianity. This, this is happening across the nations of the world. So in that morning, when the Lord brought this into my hand, it was humbling. I remember for the next uh, a week or two or month. I, I, was, I was almost like a lost little boy. I was eating, I was drinking, but emotionally on the inside, I was like a little boy lost. I don't know about people who keep saying that God speaks to you, but God speaks to me. I lose my whole self. I become a little boy. And it's almost like, you know, in English we say, you know, it's like, you know, whatever you're standing on, someone pull, you know, the sheep right out, right away, right out of your feet. 
I was like a little boy. So I started praying very simple prayer. My age is praying simple prayer. God, I'm not like you. Teach me what it means to be like you. How, Lord, how? I've always longed to know you. Oh, this is a level. This is a dimension. This is a challenge. This is pushing the frontier like I've never had before. I began to understand that the foundation of salvation was God giving his nature to us. The very foundation of salvation is God giving his nature to us. The foundation of salvation is the partaking of his nature. The foundation of our salvation is so that our entire life, our entire life is going to eat Jesus and drink Jesus. The foundation of our salvation is that God is going to put his nature into our hearts. That God will put his very life into us. God is going to share his heart, his mind, and his will into our lives. The foundation of our salvation is so that God can recreate His image in us. The first creation was the creation of the external world. The first creation was the creation of all things that was that was by uh, by knowledge we could know by our five senses. He created the heavens and the earth. He created the stars and the galaxies. He created the mountains and the valleys, the, the, the sea. He created the waters. He created the plants, the vegetation, the animals. Where he finally then planted the first man and the first woman. That's his first creation. Paul calls it, we are now made a living soul. In other words, man becomes a living being, a living soul. Who is connected to the entire material creation. And every time when the natural man look at the mountain and the seas and the stars, what happens to the natural man? The man become thankful. The natural man become thankful. Yes, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for the water. Thank you for the air. Thank you for the vegetation. Thank you for all the creatures of the sea. The flowers of the air. Men become thankful. So men begins to worship God. Now listen, it's very important you hear the next statement. But that is not intimate knowledge. 
That's not intimate knowledge. Lord, thank you for the food. Lord, thank you for the air. Lord, thank you for the job. Lord, thank you for all the provisions. A man can thank God for all of these goodness. But as far as God is concerned, that man, that woman, has no knowledge of God yet. He receive the blessings of God. And in response, he thanked God. But he has no knowledge of God. You understand that's what you mean? That's why Adam and Eve did not know God by thanking God for all of these things. That's why God has to plant the tree of knowledge in the center of the garden. What was the tree of life for? The tree of life is for eating. How did it look like? We don't know. The Bible didn't tell us. <laughs> but the tree of life was the life of God Himself. And it was ordered by God and Adam and Eve is to obey by having to eat. To eat the tree of life. Alright? So they have to eat the tree of life into that. Because eating the tree of life is going to bring the knowledge of God on the inside. Are you clear so far? Now we all know the story from Genesis. It didn't happen. Adam and Eve did not partake of the tree of life. They got distracted. The serpent came and tempted them and they were distracted. Now that's the first creation. So God wanted man to go beyond just all the outward knowledge. He tried. He put it there in the center of the garden for Adam and Eve. But man failed. That was the story that we all know. That's why Jesus had to come. He was just Jesus in Christus. Jesus was to be the second man. Jesus The last Adam. Yes, are you clear now? So he is now the last Adam. Jesus the The second man. Is going to begin another creation. This time his creation is no longer with the material earth. The first creation has finished that. What is the second creation? The second creation now is the creation of the nature of the Father in our human lives. His second creation. Paul calls it the new creation. It's the creation of the nature of God into our human lives. That's why he has to send a perfect man. Jesus was the Father's 
perfect man. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was the father final last Adam. Jesus was the Adam. Thank God he's the last Adam. Thank God that Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. Have you grown long enough as a man and a woman and you're sick and tired to be Adam? Because all of us sitting here today, we all came from Adam. All of us here today, whether you're Malaysian or Mongolian, whoever you are, we all look like Adam. We look like Adam. And what did Adam do? Adam spent his entire life looking after all of God's first creation. Is that exactly what we've been doing? We're looking after the entire creation today. To the point, we've lost this far greater creation that is going on on the inside. Look at all of the stories of humanity today. Look at how civilization have gone today to build empires, to build wars, to build societies, to build this and that and the other. Everything that is on the outside. Look at men today. We've conquered now, we've conquered mountains, we've conquered sea, we've conquered space. We've conquered gravity, we've conquered this, we've conquered that. What's the last thing that man hasn't conquered? Ourselves. <laughs> Look at us today. You can be a great scientist. The entire, your entire staff under you love you and respect you because you are a great, great scientist. But when, you, but when you lose your temple, everybody runs away from you. <laughs> when you go home, <laughs> even your dog runs away from you. <laughs> we, we want to conquer the world. <laughs> this is the price we pay as, as humanity. <laughs> we have forsaken <laughs> our second man. <laughs> we have forsaken our new creation. And that's why it's to the church. The people of God on earth. They God have to stop this creation. And so many Christians today. Including myself. We have so little knowledge. Of the remaking. Of the creation of God's humanity in us. God's image in us. No wonder, we, no wonder we cannot know Him. No wonder we don't know Him. Because how can you know Him? How can we ever know God? You know, if I were to go to Buggy's home today, there must be many things I don't understand about Buggy. He can introduce me to his house, his bed, his dog, his car, his children, but I won't know him. I, I cannot know him. I truly know him. But I will, I will truly know him if, you know what, I have his nature in me. Are you understanding me what I say? I don't really know Buggy. He can share with me so many things about himself. What he likes, what he don't like. You don't usually do that, is it? Oh, 
How many of you know that we can vote like Mongolian men, but when it comes to killing one another, we'll kill them? <laughs> when something happens, we'll slander one another. Don't we like Mongolian men together? <laughs> See that? So we think that because we agree in food, we agree in climate, we agree in clothing, so we know one another. We cannot know one another. Not until something in our nature. It's the same. Something in our hearts is identical. That cannot happen by ourselves. I can read the Bible all my life. I can go to church all my life. I can serve God all my life. I can sacrifice my body if I need to. All of that will not make me know him. Will not be enough to cause me to know God. God has appointed only one way when we can know him. He has to put his own nature in us. Got the reason? Got the point That's why salvation is the end of all your life. That's why salvation takes away from you all your powers. All your energy. All your trying. And all your abilities to know him. That's what happens to the Apostle Paul. Did he know God? All his life, he thought he knew God. Paul said, I serve you. I followed your commandments. I honored you all my life. I followed your ways. I serve your will. I love your people. I love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I love the God of my father. Paul. Paul. Do you understand why today the entire church of Jesus Christ is built on the foundation of this man, Paul? And God has to come to this man to show to him that everything in him has no capability, no capacity, not even one atom to know God. And he was made to see it. And he saw it within himself. And that's why his repentance was so sorrowful. Why? Because he was prostituting the very thing that looks like God. What was the thing that looked like God on earth? The poor persecutor. Come on, tell me. The church. So if I he said, if I knew God, why, why am I hurting the very thing that looks like God? Which means what Paul is saying is, I don't know God. I, I thought I knew God. I thought I served God. I thought I was in service for God. But I didn't know God. I came against God. While I thought I was serving God. 
He saw that the salvation of Jesus was the end of all human ability. Jesus Christ Brothers and sisters, listen to me. There are so many today who still think that we can know God by some semblance, some little, little tiny, meaning, little ability in us to know Him. There's nothing in us. Nothing in all of our ability. That will cause us to know God. That's why salvation spells our final death to everything that is in us. Because it's only when we're dead, God begins to recreate His nature in us. His new creation begins. Hallelujah. He begins His new creation. He begins to shape, he begins to form. He begins to speak. Isn't it wonderful? He did, he did in the same mode he used for the first creation. He spoke. So that morning when God spoke, when God quicken that English word in my heart. He spoke. He didn't have to use lightning. He didn't have to use earthquake. I'm thankful. I'm not saying that God cannot use these things. I was still healthy. I wasn't sick. I didn't have sickness. I was not lying in the hospital bed. I'm thankful. And it came. I thought I knew. You know, sometimes we always sense the thing we know. Then when you hear it again, when you hear it, when God brings it into your heart, then you really don't know. I didn't know. And from that day, my entire understanding of salvation, of the knowledge of God, of the church, of the last days, everything begins to change. I begin to understand what his kingdom was like. Why, why is it that God wants to bring his kingdom to us? The kingdom of God is the rule of God. Why is it that God wants to rule you? Why is it that God wants to establish his government in me? His government is for the purpose that everything in us is going to turn and look like him. Because the kingdom of God is ruled by nature. The kingdoms of this world is ruled by violence. Is ruled by control. Is ruled by possession. Is ruled by manipulation. The kingdoms of this world is ruled by force, by, by threats, by lying, by cheating, by deceiving. The kingdom of God is ruled by nature.
Why must he bring his kingdom to us? Because his kingdom is the process, is the transformation, is the government, the governmental rule of God that will bring his nature into our lives. Do we understand so far? Do you understand why, how sacred, why Paul speaks so much about salvation in his letters? And today we make salvation look cheap in less than five minutes. Bow your head, say the sinner's prayer, sign the cup, and you are safe. Welcome. <coughs> Not in the way Paul understood salvation. <sighs> Until that nature is working to us. So, when you begin to read the writings of the apostles, you know, sometimes, I don't know whether you have experiences like that, isn't it? Sometimes, in order for, you know, sometimes you get a, you get a little bottle. Like a bottle of milk. And you want to use it, you find out that there's a lot of dirt underneath the bottle. And um, it's easy to wash a cup. It's easy to wash a cup. Where your hands can reach the depths. You know, the problem with bottles is because it's narrow. Right? The delivery hole is narrow. And so you need to you, you need to use the bottle. There's a lot of dirt here, your your finger or your hands, you can't reach it. So the only way to clean this bottle is to fill this bottle with water. Isn't it? And sometimes you even have to even use water with force, put it under a strong current. And then you notice that as the water rushes into the bottle, strangely has got a way of picking up all the dirt in there. Right. And all the debris and the dirt stuff it gets all stirred up. As long as we put it under the gushing water. Don't move the bottom. Stay under the strong water. It's forceful water. Because it will keep penetrating, isn't it? Through this little small hole. And what you see is slowly begins to overflow, isn't it? And the dirt begins to come out. All the dirt starts to be flushed out. Keep staying there. And soon before you know it, all the pure water from the source is completely filling up this bottle. That's what the writings of the apostles is all about here. <laughs> See that? Yeah. So many of us here, <laughs> somewhere deep down in our lives, <laughs> you ever open and have a look? <laughs> Some of us we go there. So <laughs> And God brings His salvation into us. 
That nature of God is going to go down. It will start to flush. It will start to tear down. Start to uncover. Starts to push out. Start to scrape the bottom. It starts to put pressure sometimes. You know, water can be powerful. It can cut. It can have concentrated effects. And that's why when you read the epistles, these apostles, Paul in particular, began to understand. The formation of God's nature in a man. Hallelujah. You know, I don't remember whether you remember the story that I say this in my first trip. What do you think that Jesus' first miracle was the turning of water into wine? You remember Jesus' first miracle? Or of all the miracles, he chose the miracle performed in Canaan. He turns water into wine. You know, I used to say this to people. I said that uh, there's something about water. It's important. It's great value. We drink water. Without water, our bodies cannot survive. It's life to our physical body. But there's something strange about water. You can do what you want with water. I give this example as if you boil water. You boil water. It gets, in, it gets into a boiling point. So out comes the steam. Isn't it? Out comes the steam. Is it collect the steam? The moment when you collect the steam, what does it become? Water. You see, water change form. It can change form. You boil water, it becomes steam. Water, steam. Form has changed. You see, it's the water. We change forms. So we can sit in the church, we can be Christian and spend our life changing our form. We dress better. Those days your hairstyle was like this. After being a Christian, your hairstyle was like this. <laughs> <laughs> Those days I smoke. Now I don't smoke. So you don't need to stop. You, you don't stop. You don't need to stop smoking by Jesus Christ. You can stop smoking by doctor telling you. I think you have early signs of cancer. You stop. Huh? Yes. All you need is just a doctor showing you the state of your lungs. You stop smoking Jesus didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. The doctor did it. You don't have to stop smoking because of Jesus. I have friends who stop smoking because, you know, they got a girlfriend. <laughs> and the girlfriend insists, you want, you want to call me? You want me to be your wife one day? Stop smoking. Okay. <laughs> His, his love for the woman or the girlfriend is far more than you know his desire to smoke, so he changed. 
can change forms. We, we, we change form today. All right. we, 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 change, we change in form. But we don't change in our nature. When Jesus turned water into wine, he was already pointing by that miracle that he has come to change nature. You know, you don't taste water, you taste wine. That's why we have what is known as wine connoisseur. In other words, wine expert. Who does that? Who smells the wine? <laughs> you don't have water connoisseur who smells the water and smells the wine. <laughs> because wine has age, has age, age needs. Wine has maturity. Wine has, has content. Has texture. You, you, don't, you don't disturb wine, you let them settle. You, you, need to, you need to prospect how it ferment underneath you know, those wine cellar. Sometimes it takes days, years. Because it goes through process formation that is mysterious. There are chemical exchange that go in down there. That's why by the time when they presented the wine to the, uh, to the, to the guests, they said, where do you got this wine from? In fact, they were the one who said, this is the best wine. He said, usually in Israel, the best wine is at the beginning of the feast, not at the end of the feast. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is the end. He is the end. He is the last. Are you listening here? What is your loss today? Your loss is not your bad experiences. Your loss is not what your father said, what your mother said. What's your loss? Your loss is not what your boss did to you. Your loss is not what happened, what people did to you. Your loss is what Jesus can give to you. Every man's last story must be the story of Jesus in his life. When Jesus is the last of your life, your life truly is beginning. Is he the last? Is he the best one? That was his first miracle. He was pointing to the fact of why he actually came. He came so that he will be the new wine of our lives. It's the beginning of that new creation that he will put within us. And today, Christians have lost the skill, the understanding of the creation of the new wine in them. Wine is always a picture of joy and celebration in the Bible. I tell you, there is no celebration in your life not until God changed 
the nature of your life. Таны амьдрал дахь мөн чанар өөрчлөгдөхөөс нааш та хизээч тэр одоо баяр хөөр мэдрэхгүй. Celebration is a wonderful thing. Баяр цэнгэл одоо баяр хөөр гэдэг чинь өөрөө Celebration is a time of fulfillment. Яг нь ямар нэгэн зүйлийг гүд одоо цагийн гүд сэтгэлийг харагдаж Celebration is a time of harvest. А баяр хөөр гэдэг маань өөрөө ургацаа аваж байгаа юм. Celebration celebration is a time of maturity. Энэ төлөвшөлтийн одоо бэл одоо үрдүү. None of these things are going to come to our lives. Тэ бидний амьдралд энэ бүх нь би болж чадахгүй юм. Тэр яагаад? Until God begins the process of the new wine. Бурхан бидний дотор шин барсаа бүтээх ажлаа хийхгүй бол бид нар хизээч тэр баяр өөр л очиж чадахгүй. What is the story today? Өнөөдрийн түүх яг юу гэдэг чинь? What has the story of God's nature been doing in us? Бурхан өнөөдөр бидний дотор мөн чанараа байгуулж байгаа тэр түүх. So many of us we can't tell those stories. That's why, because we can't tell those stories. So many of us cannot tell ourselves. When you don't have your story to tell, you have no self, yourself to tell. You can't tell yourself that people don't know who you are. Yourself, our self is only shared, our self is only made known by our stories. Are you listening here today? That's why so many of us can sit in the church for years and yet nobody knows who you are. We only want people to see the part that we want people to see. But the point? We only want people to see the part that we want people to see. That means we want people to only see the part ah, we want them to see. You know, one of the prophets in the Old Testament said, He said, Israel, you are like wine that have settled that have not been empty from tank to tank, from barrel to barrel. You know, a part of the process of making wine in Israel in those days is you pour this wine from barrel to barrel to barrel. Because every pouring removes the dirt. All the unnecessary things. Right? So every time, every time when you pour the wine, something that is not needed, something that is not required in the wine is removed. And so the prophet said to the nation of Israel, he said, you are like wine that is settled out in the pot. <laughs> And all you leaves, in other words, all your debris is floating up on the top. And you're looking like that. So you want people to see what you want people to see. It's just there. See, don't move, just stay there. Right. Don't move, just stay there. You want to just stay there? Yeah. Don't move. Don't. Just slowly walk. A B B B B B. Just go there. Quiet. Just sit down there. Just say, raise your hand. Put the money in the box. Put the money in the offering box. Smile. Say hello. Say God bless you. Don't move. Slowly now, go to the lift now. Just 
We want people to see what is in us, or we want people to see the part that we want people to see in us. The moment we go downstairs, we put the cap on, we put the bottle back, so there is no process. So the new wine can never show. We can never see the coming of the new wine. We can never have someone, God can never take it and taste it on his lips. He could taste it. And what is so disagreeable to God, how could God share it with humanity? How can God give it? If he doesn't want it, that's why so many Christian life with no celebration. No joy of God in them to be shared to others. No satisfaction of God for God to share with others. What brings joy to God will soon one day bring joy to a lot of people. What brings satisfaction to what brings satisfaction to God? Will bring satisfaction to many people. God will always share that which He enjoys, that which He takes pleasure. That's why Jesus. That's why the Father could, should share Jesus with the with the world. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's why He could share Jesus with the nations of the world. It's the nature. Should we have a break and then have them come back? Would that be good? Yes, 10 minutes maybe. And then we can come back. Let's pray, shall we? You pray. Straight from all God. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> So we left off with a very important uh, foundation that we need to learn. Now, test this word that I'm sharing with you. My challenge to you is not just take what I said to you and uh, begin to check the scripture. Begin to test this word that I'm sharing with you. And 
begin to search the scripture and you'll find uh, all through not only the words of Jesus you'll find that even the writings and the works of the apostles not just Paul but Peter and James and John and Titus and Timothy you find that all of their writings will again and again return to this foundation. It's the foundation of the nature of God that he has come to put it in us through Jesus Christ. That's why the tragedy today is that we have understood salvation in a very in a very shallow way. The church has not understood the concept and the very purpose of salvation. Do you know that many of the songs, many of the hymns wrote in the past uh, 500 years? All right. You notice that a lot of these hymns were written because of the way they understand salvation. And you notice that every time you sing many of these songs about salvation, it all has to do with going to heaven. How life is so horrible, how sorrowful, how life is difficult here on earth. And salvation is the promise that one day we're going to live in the big mansion in heaven. So many Christians are actually waiting to die and die quickly. Because life is so hard here on earth. So they want to die so that they can quickly go to the place of their salvation, heaven. And yet, if you read your Bible from the Old Testament to the New, God is against death. <laughs> the Jews are against death. You, you the Psalms and the Psalmist doesn't want to die quickly. He said, Lord, I don't want to die now. If I go to the grave, how can I praise you? So, so somehow we seem to think that salvation is God separating you know, our soul from our body. That everything about this body is bad. Oh, this body can do bad things. But because this body has done bad things, that doesn't mean that God doesn't want the body. He created this body. He gave us this body. He gave Jesus a body. If God hates this body so much, then he must put Jesus in something different. Huh? Put him in a robot that the one we see in Injun Airport is it around. He put Jesus in a physical human body. Do you know that that's salvation? Salvation is the wholeness of the spirit and the soul and the body of a man. Salvation is God making Everything in us whole. 
Because the nature of God needs the body, needs the soul, and needs the spirit. Because without this body, how can God display his character? But you say, but my soul has the nature of Jesus, but Without a body? <laughs> what do we see? Yeah. Oh, you, you're floating around in the air? You see the point now? So death is not even welcome in the Bible. Because death separates. Death separates the body from the soul. That's why at the end, when Jesus returns, that's why body and soul is going to be put together again. See the point now? So he is going to put the body together. He's going to put the soul and the body together. How is it the Christians who say that they are saved, they want their soul to leave their body? They want to quickly die here and finish everything and then go to heaven. So many mothers uh, uh, fathers are talking to the children. They say, you know, I can't wait to go. I'm sick and tired of seeing your face. I want to go see, Je- see Jesus. They say, I want to go see Jesus. So the children are all helping them. Go quickly. Die quickly. Go see Jesus. <laughs> Since you don't see all our faces, you go see Jesus' face. And then when they are sick, they ask the daughters and the sons to admit to the hospital. No, no, no more hospital. Go to heaven. Die quickly and go to heaven. So our understanding of salvation is flawed, is erroneous, and that's the reason today why so many sitting in the church of Jesus Christ are not prepared in their lives to know God. That's why there's so many Christians today that have no knowledge of God. And once we have no knowledge of God, that's why God becomes a thing. Something. That's why we don't fear God. There's a word in English, we trivialize God. In other words, you know, we make God look like us. We cheapen God. We start to make a God after our own heart. And that's why when people start, when, when you start to be like this, you can read scripture and interpret the scripture according to what you want. And there are men and women today who is making God the way they want by the way they read the scripture. And that's why that's behavior. The product of nature, the produce of nature, is behavior. Uh-huh. Got the point now? Watch the behavior. Because behavior comes out of nature. If nature is the root, Behavior is the fruit. Mm-hmm. Got the point? Mm-hmm. So you got to see how important this is. Mm-hmm. Is the root first before the fruits? 
That's why salvation, according to John the Baptist, is God sending Jesus. And Jesus is going to take the axe and lay it to the root of the tree. Jesus why is salvation like an axe and going to the root? Because that's where it all is. Because our, our nature is defiled. Our nature is corrupted, it's dark. Our father is Satan. Our soul and everything in us has Listen and be obeying the spirit that is in the air. We let our life fulfilling the lust of our flesh. The lust of our eyes. And so that nature, that bad nature, that sinful nature has to be circumcised. So Jesus is Jesus. God's X-Men. Jesus. You preach, you preach a message today in the church that Jesus is God's X-Men, the church will be empty. Because so many Christians yeah, have never had their roots severed. So if he doesn't sever the roots, he cannot connect your roots to his nature. That's the point. Because he has to take the, your roots and profit with his nature. So once the root is in place, See that? A nature is in place. There you are. I can't go to this Bible and see and find out what I want. This book has an author. And the, and the author of this book, the author of this book, and the author of this book is God himself. And the same God that is living in us, producing the same nature in me, begin to cross me to see his nature here. It's not doctrines. It's not creed, it's not dogma, it's not theology. It's nature. You start to see the nature of God here. So many men and women, when they read the Bible, they don't see God's nature. They see what they want. They want blessings. They want riches. They want to laugh in the meeting. So they went and look for the scripture that looks that, that has laughing. <laughs> and Sarah conceived a son at the age of uh, 90 and she laughed. <laughs> 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 How stupid can we be? <laughs> you go into the scripture and use it so that it can confirm what you want. And we have we've done that. The history of the church in the last 2,000 years have done this again and again. They don't go to this book and see the face of Jesus. See the heart of God. And see the very sorrow and the feeling and all of the burdens that is in God's heart. 
When was the last time you ever read this book and your eyes were wet? When? When was the last time you read this book and you wept? Because when you read it, you were convicted. Something of the nature of God begins to vibrate in you. I was so moved by a testimony recently. I'm, I'm not talking about any ordinary minister of God. He's known today as one of the greatest, one of the greatest political scholars of our time. I don't know him. But I have his writings in my library. He's a very, he's a very unassuming man. In other words, he doesn't talk a lot about himself. Yes, his writing has blessed the church for the last 15 years. I've always enjoyed what he writes. But recently I came to know him a little bit better through his daughter. And I didn't know that his daughter was an associate professor at one of the Bible schools in America. She's not a very old lady, she's somewhere in the early 40s. And uh, I didn't know that she, he had a daughter who is, who is, who is uh, that's who she is, and that's what she has become. I didn't know that. The daughter started to write a book together with the dad. And at the beginning of the book, this is what she said. He said, my dad has so much of knowledge. He said, I sit before my dad, the knowledge of the Bible, the knowledge of Paul. He said that thousands of people will write letters to him, students that he has taught will write letters to him about how their lives have been blessed because of his teaching. He said, this is what the world saw my dad. He said, this is how I saw my dad. And she gave an example. The dad was teaching in the Bible school. Very famous Bible school. And one day she finished her work in the hospital and she was driving you know, uh, across the road, across the Bible school. And he got a call from the dad and said that, uh, I'm late, could you, on the way back from the hospital, pick me up, please? So she parked, at the car, she parked the car and she woke up, I think, some floors, you know, the faculty, and there was a, there was a department and he had an office by himself. The lights were on in the office. The light was on, was on in the office. But there was no one in the office. So there was no one in the office. The dad said, come at this time to pick me. He said, the lights were on, but there was no one in the office. So he walked closer to the office. He, he opened the door. The door was left open. It's, it's the father. It's the father. This daughter was looking for the father. So as he approached the father's office, he didn't see the father. But as he walked past the door, she, she heard sobbing. She, she heard her father crying. And she looked, he ran around looking, you know, the books and the professors, all the books all around. And saw the father behind the pile of books, and she, he was prostrate on the floor. He was sobbing. He was crying, he was crying, calling. Jesus. So the daughter 
immediately thought, you know, the daughter being a daughter, she said, Dad. Für die Achtel, die sind schon cool. Cool. Yeah. Dad, are you okay? She thought it was. So the dad immediately got up, pulled a tissue, and so I'm waving. Dad, are you all right? I'm good. I'm all right. I'm good. I'm all right. And then he sat in the chair. Oh, I said, everything all right, Dad? Yeah, I'm all right. So I was just going through the scripture that I'll be teaching tomorrow. I was, I was just, I was just reading Paul writing to the Philippian. Oh, he said, he said, Cherry, Cherry, he said, how we have misunderstood the Bible. He called the, the daughter Cherry. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so wonderful. He He's a great professor, he's a great theologian, he's a great Bible scholar. He, he, he reads his Bible in Greek. Some of us read English, we've got a problem. <laughs> he reads his Bible in Greek. The intelligence, uh, the, his brilliant mind. But you see, he didn't go to the Bible looking for things for himself. Something in the something of the nature of God in him began to show to him what God who God is. And then, and then every time when God begins to reveal his heart to you, something in you dies. Something in you surrender. Something in you give up. Something in you repent. Something in you say, God, I'm so sorry. Something in you make you feel so inadequate. Make you feel so weak. So Jared said, that's my dad. So suddenly the world for the first time you oh you see how we understand knowledge today. Knowledge is because I know the Bible. Knowledge is because I I, I studied this book, you know, in and out, out and in and I know all there is to know in the Bible. You can know the Bible and yet not know God. You can memorize the Bible and yet never walk with Jesus one single day. Test this word that I'm sharing with you. The apostle understood that salvation. The apostles. They understood that salvation was the impartation of the life of God in a man. The salvation is the beginning, is the beginning of the new creation of God in a man. It is a new creation that will continue for all eternity. That's why Paul wrote to the Romans and said that this is why we have been saved. That we might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's why you're supposed to be an image, listen, you're supposed to be an image, how we call that? You're supposed to long for the image of Jesus. Hunger for the image of Jesus. Now, I want to take this, this short time before we close. 
I want, to, I want to take you to the Hebrew letter. Hebrew letter. I'm going to read the scripture here. Of which we're going to come back in the next few lunch together. Hebrews and chapter 7. The letter to the Hebrews Chapter 7, verse 11 and 12, or verses 11 and 12. Yes. Yes, please. Here, two schools of Badlin, David, he had a chin over the rest of the person of us, or she moved the rooms to whom was heard of the bed. You are only hearing me down the little sweet, which is taking hearing me down for she, or Tapit Sasha picked up. All right. In, in all of Jesus' office and attributes, I don't know if you can find the word. Jesus holds many offices. His prophet, his king, his judge, his shepherd. So many other offices, so many, many attributes that Jesus has, all through the scripture. But there is one right now, only one, only one office that Jesus right now is consciously operating in. Some of these offices he has exercised before. Alright, he's known as the great shepherd of Israel. He did this all through the beginnings and to the close of the Old Testament of the history of Israel. And he has been faithful in that office. There's some office or attributes that is pointing to the future. He is king of kings and lord of lords. That is an office and an attribute that is waiting to be fulfilled in the future. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus is not king today. He is king. But is he king over Mongolia? No. Is he king over Malaysia yet? No. Is he king over America yet? No. But is he king today before God? Yes, he is. But it is a kingship waiting for fulfillment. So some of these offices and attributes, either he has it before or that he will have it in the future. But, but God has chosen to allow him to operate now, currently, presently, in one office. And, he, and he's doing it right now at Father's right hand. Is the office or the attribute of a priest? Now, in my search from that morning onwards, this has been my personal journey, the journey of my priesthood. I want to share this with you. Very misunderstood today in our time. Sadly. Alright. It's sadly today that this whole priesthood has been taken completely out of its understanding, out of its proper understanding. So he, it is said that he will be a priest forever. Now, once we understand priesthood, or once we begin to read of the priesthood, 
He notices that there is two that God raised up in history. One is known as the Levitical priesthood that we all know in the Old Testament. Right. The Levitical priesthood he comes from the son of Levi. So, right. so the Levi and the tribes of Levi took on the priesthood. They became the priesthood of Israel. And of course, the first high priest of the Levitical priesthood was Aaron. Alright? Now God chose the priesthood for Israel. He chose the priesthood one day for all mankind. Now before we understand what truly is the priesthood, we need to understand why the priesthood. The first word to understand priesthood is the word mediator. Mediator is always there is two parties. And a mediator is one who stands between in this case, the two party is God and man. Now this is very important because this is at the very foundation. Of a relationship that God has purpose in his heart. Now, you must understand that right at the very beginning in God's heart His understanding was His purpose was that He's going to share His nature with men. That's why as great as the first creation God could not share His nature with men. The sky, the sea, the water, the, the valleys, the, the, everything in this creation, it's wonderful. It can cause men to be thank, to be full of thanksgiving and worship God. But in all of that goodness, God still cannot put his nature inside a man. And that is ultimately his intention. He must, he must have his nature shared. What makes God so desirous, so wanting to share his nature? Someone has an answer? What is it that makes God wants to share his nature? Love. Love is the reason why God wants to share his nature. Alright? Just to let you know that. Paul understood that later. Why is it that God chose to do what he did? Why must God go through such pain and such depth of agony finally on that cross? For what? Paul understood is because of love. So the, so can you imagine in all the glories of the creation? You know, I, I because Eugene preached one of the last, one of the Sundays he preached, he read from Psalm 19. <laughs> All right. Anyone here know familiar immediately in your mind? Can you remember Psalm 19? <laughs> David wrote Psalm 19, by the way. <laughs> and will you read Psalm 19? 
Right at the beginning of Psalm 19, David talks about the glories of the creation. How wonderful is the creation. It's a beautiful turn across the universe that God has given to man. It displays all of God's great glories. The creation is wonderful. Then immediately he shifts gear. Where did he shift gear? Anyone wants to turn to Psalm 19? Yeah. Oh, come on. So David begins to shift gear, and this is what you get when he shifts gear. There you are. Psalm 19, he shifts gear. So he begins from verse 1 to verse 6 with the creation. Then he started to shift gear in verse 7 onwards. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether. What happened suddenly? What happened to the great glories of the creation? The same God who created the entire universe, listen, is the same God that David understood that by his word he wants to create himself in us. That's what the law of God is about. That's what the law of God is about. That's what the testimony of the Lord is all about. That's what the precepts of the Lord is all about. It all refers to the word. The word. The word of God now. Wants to create himself in us. Amen. He can create the world. Day one, day two, day three. I wish sometimes God could do this with all of us here. Day one. Some, some of us here we have been sitting here thousands of days. Hundreds of days. And what has been created in you? I ask you to test what I just said, what I said at the beginning. Test this with this word, with this book. Say that now. So now, very quickly. So God in his wisdom. He chose a particular character, a particular office, sorry. Of all that he chose, he chose the priesthood. He chose the office of a priest. Now very important, I want you to see this now. Later in the book of Hebrews, you read that Jesus is that mediator. But this is basically what we need to understand before we close the night. The function of a priest was to be a mediator between God and between men. Very important. Because that's the way in which he has chosen to share his nature with men. He has chosen the path, the office, the attributes, the function of the priest to share his nature 
Got the point now? So you notice that in the Old Testament, the priest is constantly having, first of all, to face God first. We all, know, we all know the story in the book of Exodus, how frightening that can be. So Aaron was the first high priest. So, so you see the performance and you see the work of the Aaronic priesthood. So he faces God. He receives from God. He receives the word. He receives the instruction. And in those words and instruction, Aaron begins to know what was in God's heart. What is it that grieved God? That's why he's so frightened. Because he has to be prepared for many days. And he can't just walk inside the tabernacle wearing his pajamas. He has to be prepared with all of the priestly garments. Every piece was to be specially made. Every color had to be sewn into the garment. Every of, the, every of those uh, garments have to be according to as God instructed Moses. So he stands before the presence of the Lord who only appears once in a year and with all of the counsel with all of what God has spoken into his heart. He takes, he takes of that burden and he turns if he's alive <laughs> and he goes out to the front of the tabernacle and he faces it and he proclaims what God has spoken to him what God desired what God was hurt about what God was so displeased about. What was his desire for the nation of Israel? And Aaron was full of weaknesses himself. He was not a perfect man. He had a lot of weaknesses. So God begins to teach them to sacrifice animals. Take those animals and cleanse yourself. And begin to stand before men. Because these men are also sinful. Have them partake in the sacrifice of these animals and their blood. So Israel saw the infirmities of the nation of Israel. He saw the rebellion of the children of Israel. He saw his own imperfection. That's why he, he has to be covered with all of the garments. Not a, not a single part of his flesh was exposed. Can you imagine he had a priestly garment that went all the way down, you know, like a maxi, you know, like a like a woman's dress all the way down. Which, which men wear wear like that one? <laughs> Every part of his body was all covered. He stood before God. He stood before men. He knew the broken, broken nature of 
тэр хүний интерсэн мөн чанарыг хартдаг байсан юм амьддаг байсан юм. And God begin to show him it cannot be repaired. Тэгээд турхан энэ гимшээд ч нэмэргүй гэдэг тэгт харсан. You can't repair it on your own. Чи өөрөөр гимшээд чадах. You can't change on your own. Чи өөрийгөө өөрчлөж чадахгүй. Have a better career. Have a better career. Сайн одоо ажилтай байж байгаасан. Сайн хэрэгтэй Death of all of these animals have to come about. The blood that comes from these dead animals will be collected. Are you, are you hearing this? And this blood cannot be spilled anywhere. It has to be applied on their bodies. For Aaron has to be applied on his ears. is done and is those Aaron of course chike te dishke goruga da goruga na because your whole life the whole life is about hearing and doing and walking te tsusar ingech turhtdeg bas yaag tihlet bidni bukh amdirl man sonsoh kiy alhaqta you don't know how to do bid ter yaag sonsdo mitdgu we don't know how to do bid ter yaag chike mitdgu was of all we don't know how to walk te bas bid ter yaag alhaqta mitdgu I'm watching my granddaughter walking. Би аж ихнээ алах чаа хатаар ингэж ялах. Йоо, kind of enjoy. Come on, get out of here. Be better than that. Guys doing the same thing with some of you here 70 years old. Танд энэ дараа зарим төчин 70 жилийн дараа бурхан ингэ ярьж чадах. Би яах вэ басаар байна. We don't know how to walk. Би тэр яаж алах юм бэ? We don't know how to walk. Мэддэг гэж боддог. Just because we're educated with money. So we know how to walk. Бас сайн боловсрол эзэмшсэн мөнгөтэй учраас яаж алах юм бэ? See how important that is. Энэ ямар ч бол олон удаа хаалт. This is God. Presenting the priesthood to the nation of Israel. Бурхан эд нөгөө тахилчийн Израилийн арт төмд ингэж харуулж байгаа. I want to share my nature with you. Би таамартай өөрийнхөө мөн чанарыг хуваалцмаар байна гэж тахилчийн So when he called Israel. He didn't call Israel to be a great nation. Тэр Израилийг агуу үндэстэн байхаар дуудаагүй. To conquer. Одоо нөгөө эзлэн төрөнгийн шалтгаан дуудаагүй. To become powerful. Хүчирхэг болол тэ байлтанд агуулахаар дуудаагүй. To become a nation of army and strength and sword and shield. Хүч чадал илт сэлэмний бамбай улс үндэстэн байхаар дуудаагүй. He said, "I call you to be a kingdom of priests." Би таамрыг хаант тахилчдгүй тахишнарын хаантлал байх гар дуудсан юм аас. Because it's in the priesthood. Яа гэхээр тахилчлал дотор. God will begin to share his nature with us. Бурхан биднээ өөрийнхөө мөн чанарыг хуваалцсан юм болно. The function of the priesthood. Тахилчийн ажил. That the nature of God begins the process of growing into our lives. Юу юм бэ? Гэхдээ бурхны мөн чанар бидний амьдрал дотор өсөх. Аллилуйя. Please come back tomorrow. Мара ши ирээд гоо чишээ. Because so many of us бидний олонхон are not priests. Тэгэлч биш байна. The Christian Father we thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the hearts and the lives of these dear ones. Thank you for the church in Mongolia. Thank you that you have established a witness here in this nation. 
Thank you that you are speaking your word to all of us here. Restoring our foundation. Causing our lives to stand on what truly belongs to you. We thank you that you chose this time and this season to bring a foundation that has been neglected for so long. We thank you that you are telling us what it was at the beginning in your heart. So Lord, we have tried so hard. We thank you for the correction. We thank you for the adjustment. We thank you for the light. We thank you for your word. Continue to minister and continue to speak with this word right into the nights in our hearts. And the whole of tomorrow. Go with us. That which you have began, you are faithful. You watch over this work. It will not be lost. It will not be lost. It will be kept and preserved in the heart and the spirit of men and women here. We watch for the time of its harvest. The seed that you sow here tonight, you watch for its harvest. It will be a harvest of celebration. A celebration of life. The celebration where this church and the lives of many will share this with many, many Mongolians, men and women. We thank you, my God. Thank you. Thank you that you chose your nature in us for us to love you. And you have excluded every human capability and human strength for us to ever know you. For this we give you praise and we give you thanks as you go with us here tonight. We worship you, we honor you, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.